which batch of principles are we on now? Say that again. 13. Okay, principle number 13. This is from which batch? Principle That's right, yeah. So this, these are principles pertaining to when the marriage starts to rock. Principle 13. This is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, in Surah Al-Talaq, chapter of the divorce, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ يُسْرَى Whoever has taqwa of Allah, taqwa, conscious of Allah, mindful of Allah, Allah will make matters easy for him. And just from the translation of this Quranic principle, it's clear to you how effective a strategy it is for a husband and wife because if Allah Jalla Jalaluhu is promising to make things easy for them, then what do they have to worry about? And what is interesting is that this is a promise from Allah Jalla Jalaluhu that is made in no less than five different places in Surah Al-Talaq. He promises five different prizes for those who have taqwa in their marriages in the chapter of divorce. So Allah will say, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Whoever has taqwa of Allah, He will provide for him a way out. وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ And He will provide for him, for her, from where they least expect. Two promises. Then Allah Almighty, He says, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ يُسْرًا Whoever has taqwa of Allah, He will make matters easy for him. Promise number three from the same surah of divorce. Promises four and five. Allah Almighty says, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يُكَفِّرْ عَنْهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِ Whoever has taqwa of Allah, your sins will be erased. Promise number five. وَيُعْظِمْ لَهُ أَجَرًا And Allah will amplify for him the reward. I'm asking you a question, brothers. Why are there all of these promises and this emphasis of taqwa Consciousness of Allah, fear of Allah, mindfulness of Allah within the chapter of divorce. How come? It's only a short surah. Surah Al-Talaq, you know, how long is it? It's about two, two sides. Yeah, this huge emphasis of being conscious of Allah, mindful of His limits. How come? Why not in Surah Al-Tahreem? Why not in Surah Al-Mulk? Why in the chapter of divorce? Omar, what do you think? <coughs> because it is probably when it is needed most. When you are going through a turbulent situation with your spouse, and you are going through divorce proceedings, or divorce is on the cards, or one party or the other is always threatening with divorce, what is needed most during that time? Taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When do people slip off the rails the most usually? When do they behave in the bold, boldest and most audacious and brazen of ways? It's usually when they are going through a procedure of talaq. It's like recklessness just hones in and everything is justified. So Allah gives five promises to the people of taqwa in Surah Al-Talaq. Taqwa, by the way, I don't want to go through it because this is not the purpose of today's evening. What is taqwa, which this principle is promising, will bring about ease in your matters? There are many definitions. Some of the scholars have said it is al khawfu min al jalil, the fear of Allah, wa al amalu bit tanzil, applying revelation in your life, wa rida bil qalil, being content with what comes your way. And preparing for the day of departure. Many people have given different definitions that was attributed to Ali ibn Abi Talib. But if you want to put them all together, the idea of taqwa is about you being a good Muslim. You apply the instructions of Islam as best you can, and you avoid the prohibitions of Islam as best you can. And you apologize and make amends to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu when you fall short as best you can. You are therefore a person who is muttaqi, a person of taqwa, mindful of Allah, conscious of Allah. What is the principle here promising that we are studying? 
whoever has taqwa of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, he will make matters easy for him. Subhanallah. Now you will ask me the question, what are the dimensions of taqwa? What examples do we have of a couple who act upon taqwa when their relationship begins to rock? I'll give you a, a few practical examples. Number one, a couple who have taqwa, when they go through a problem, they flee to salah as a cure. When was the last time you did this, my brother or my sister? In the face of your trauma, your ordeal, your disagreement with your spouse, you spread out the prayer mat, you said, Allahu Akbar, as if to say, my Lord, I am placing the reins of my problem with you. I don't know how to navigate this situation. You take care of it for me. Will Allah Jalla Jalaluhu let down a person like that? Salah. And that is why Hudayf ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu, he said, كَانَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا حَزَبَهُ أَمْرٌ فَزِعَ إِلَى الصَّلَى He said, whenever the Prophet alayhi salatu was was distressed by a matter, what would he do? Would he call upon his shaykh? Call upon angel Jibreel alayhi salam? Would he gather the sahaba for consultation? Amir al-Mu'mineen Abu Bakr, Umar Uthman Ali? No. He said his very first port of call was salah. He would flee to salah. La ilaha illallah. And one of our brothers, who I know went through hell and back in his marital life, with respect to his spouse and with respect to his household as a whole. And the brother was asked, how did you deal with it? What did you do? What was your coping strategy? He pointed to the prayer mat on the floor. He said this. This spoke about the tears that were shed on that prayer mat and the supplication that was made to Allah from that prayer mat and the expression of beseechment that he made to Allah from that prayer mat and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amended his life in a wholesome way thereafter. So the people of taqwa, they refer to salah during their difficult moments. And what is the promise? What is the outcome? Yaj'allahu min amrihi. Yusra, Allah will make matters easy for the people of taqwa. That's one example. A second example is that a couple who have taqwa, they raise their hands to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu in dua and they complain to him before they complain to anyone else. And here I remember Khawla bintu Thalaba radiallahu anha a female companion who was complaining to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of her husband Aus ibn al-Samit, the brother of Ubadah ibn al-Samit. They had a fallout and she felt deserted and she raised her hands to Allah and she wept to her Lord. She complained of the marital difficulty she was going through and then she went to the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa sallam to see if he can give some advice as well. So Allah revealed a very famous ayah from the Qur'an. Which ayah is it, my brothers? Exactly. قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا Allah heard the statement of the woman who was arguing with you, O Prophet, about her husband. وَتَشْتَكِي إِلَى اللَّهِ She was complaining to Allah. وَاللَّهُ يَسْمَعُ تَحَاوْرَكُمَا And Allah heard your conversation. إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ Allah is hearing and knowing. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Our mother Aisha, she said, سُبْحَانَ الَّذِي وَسِعَ سَمْعُهُ الْأَصْوَاتِ Praise be to the one whose hearing encompasses all sounds. She said, I was next to the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam of the same room where he was speaking to Khawla. And I would hear some of what they would say and I would miss out on the other details. It was muffled. But Allah Almighty heard the details of the conversation from above seven heavens. She complained to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu of her problem. And so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed verses from Surah Al-Mujalala, addressing her and addressing her likes, putting her out of her relief, putting her out of her misery, and putting many of our sisters out of their misery as well with these divine instructions. When was the last time you did that? As a, as a household of taqwa, you raised your hands to Allah and you complained to Him. What about he who responds to the distressed when he calls upon him? 
And subhanAllah, I remember the story which Al-Qurtubi mentions in his tafsir pertaining to this. When Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn al-Khattab, many years after the death of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and the death of Abu Bakr, he has become Khalifa, Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar. And he's walking with his entourage, his men around him. And all of a sudden, an old senile woman stops Umar radiallahu anhu in his tracks whilst he is on his horse. And she begins to admonish him. And she says to him, Ya Umar, O oh Umar, كان يقال لك عمير Back in the days they used to call you Umair, small Umar. ثم قيل لك عمر Then they started to call you Umar, you became a man. ثم قيل لك أمير المؤمنين And now you have the title of leader of the believers. فاتق الله يا عمر So be fearful, fearful of Allah, O oh Umar. فإنه من أيقن بالموت خاف الفوت Because the one who knows that death is real will fear missing out on the opportunity of life. وَمَنْ أَيْقَنَ بِالْحِسَابِ خَافَ الْعَذَابِ And whoever knows that the reckoning is real will be afraid of the punishment. She went on and on and on. And Umar, lowering his head and listening to the words of this old woman without interrupting her. Then she left. And then the men, they say to Umar, you stopped the entire army because of an old woman. And Umar, he said, if that woman spoke to me from the morning till the evening, I would not have interrupted her once, only for salah, and I would have come back to listen to her. Do you know who this woman was? He said to his men. That is Khawla bint Tha'labah, who complained to Allah Almighty because of her husband, and Allah heard her words, so Allah hears her words, and I should then cover my ears. La ilaha illallah. See the status that she was granted because of what? Because she raised her hands to Allah in dua when she was going through a marital discord. When was the last time you did that? Knocking on the door of al Karim, complaining, saying, Ya Rabb, deal with my trauma. SubhanAllah. That is number two. A second example of what taqwa looks like. When difficulty rocks the house of a Muslim family. And what is the outcome? The promised prize. What is it, brothers? يَجْعَلَّهُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ يُسْرَى Allah will make matters easy. Promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A third example of what taqwa looks like in a marital home is that they do not engage in men with a shadda on the noon. What is men? How do we translate men? Malik? La. كيف المن نترجم يا شيخ؟ صعبة. أمم زكريا كيف نترجم المن؟ المن. That's not the opposite of woman. No, you're hungry, ah? It's not المن والسلوى. That's a food. Yeah, but although. It has uh, the same derivatives of Umar. There's a reason why it was called Al-Man, what they ate, Bani Israel. Yeah? Al-Man means what? Aywa? Who told you? It is to remind someone of your favors. Al-Man is when you remind someone of your favors upon them. I did this for you, and I did that for you. Remember when I gave you this, and remember when I did that. And if you would like to spoil a relationship very quickly, I advise you to use this ingredient and you will spoil your relationship. Call it friendship, call it work relationship, or call it the closest of them all marriage. A potent ingredient in spoiling relationships is this horrible ingredient and disgusting trait of a human being, which is men reminding each other of why you have the upper hand. And here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say, as in Nasa'i narrates in his Sunnah, he would say, لا يدخل الجنة منان ولا عاق ولا مدمن خمر One who is manan, reminding people of his favors, and one who is disobedient to mother and father, and one who is addicted to alcohol, will not enter Jannah. 
And in another narration, terrifying, Wallah, thalathatun la yukallimuhum Allahu yawm al-qiyamati wa la yanzuru ilayhim wa la yuzakihim wa lahum athabun alim. There are three categories of people whom Allah will not look at them on the day of judgment and he will not purify them. And they will have a severe punishment. And the first of the three, he said, al-mannan, the one who reminds people of his favors. Now here I must add a caveat, a disclaimer. What we are referring to here as men, this major sin, is not so much somebody who finds himself compelled to remind of his favors because his favors are being denied. You're being told you've never done anything. You've never added any value to the relationship. You've done nothing. What have you done? And therefore you put in a situation where you have to remove this amnesia from this individual and remind them of what you actually have done for them. That's not what we are speaking about. We're speaking about someone who does good to others with the intention of using it as a weapon against them when they need it. With the intention of having that leverage and that upper hand when they require it. Or those who remind people of their favors upon them to demean them, to belittle them. And as Al-Qurtubi rahimahullah, he said, the ones who behave with these characteristics are either are usually one of two people. Bakhil, one who is a miser, penny-pinching miser, or either one who is mutakabbir, one who is conceited, arrogant. They are the ones who usually do this the most. Why the miser? Because he is very attached to his wealth. And so what little he may give, it feels like he's given a lot. It hurt him. So he has to constantly remind you of what he had offered you because by his nature, he is attached to what he'd given you. And it's also the trait of the one who is arrogant, who feels that I have favors upon you, and therefore I am above you. And these are lowly traits in the human being. So people of taqwa, husband and wife, they don't behave like this. Allah forbade this in the Quran. And when they do that, Allah says, Allah will make matters easy for them. That is example number what? Number three. Example number four of what taqwa could look like between husband and wife is that they lower their gaze. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله قل للمؤمنين يغضوا من أبصارهم ويحفظوا فروجهم Allah said, tell the believing men to lower their gaze and to protect their private parts. That will be better for them. And in the ayah after it, Allah gives the same instructions to women. كل الحوادث مبداها من النظر ومعظم النار من مستصغر الشرر أبن القيم, he says, every calamity begins with a glance. And most fires begin with a spark. And when speaking about the gaze, our minds instantly turn to the porn industry. One of the vice presidents of one of the biggest pornography websites out there, he says boastingly that we have about 11 petabytes worth of content. Do you know how much that is? That's about 7,000 years worth of filming. And that has come into the household of the average child, let alone the average adult. And they say now that the average first exposure of pornography, watch out for your children, dear brothers and sisters, is around the age of eight to nine years old. Imagine. In a study that was done in the year 2020 by the journal of sex research, they found that over 90% of men and over 60% of women had consumed indecent content within the last month of that survey. So that's your average church goer, that's your average friendly masjid goer, that's your average colleague. There is nothing to suggest that they are not all victims of the same statistic. It is a musibah, a calamity. And one of the studies that happened in the year 2002, where 350 divorce lawyers were interviewed, 60% of them said that the divorces we dealt with 
pornography was a chief contributor in the breakdown of that relationship, 60%. It all begins with this. So the people of Taqwa, they lower their gaze. Why was your grandfather happily married, married ever after with your grandmother? Why were my grandparents happy? For the most part, with their hurdles and their booms and their busts. How come? Because your grandfather married your grandmother and he saw nobody but your grandmother till the day he kept, went into the grave. <laughs> what is the situation today? The average mobile phone, the average child today, sees through his phone in one day through his social media feed more content than what your grandfather may have seen perhaps in his entire life. Your grandfather only saw your grandmother and today you can't help but see the anatomy of the opposite gender forced into your face wherever you may turn and this is causing problems. It is poisoning marriages. And I'm not referring to simply this hard content. Something as simple as social media as well. James Sexton, another divorce lawyer, he calls Facebook a, an infidelity generating machine. You know what he said when he was interviewed by Sean Illing? He said, I cannot remember the last time I came across a divorce case where social media was not the direct cause or was implicated one way or another. Then he said, it is always the exact same story unfolding again and again. Grown adults engaging in conversations with people whom they have no business speaking to. And he said, social media is poisoning marriages. You see, but those husbands and wives who fear Allah Jalla Jalalu, and they lower their gaze, وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ إِلَىٰ مَا مَتَّعْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِنْهُمْ زَهْرَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا لِنَفْتِنَهُمْ فِيهِ Allah has promised for them what? The people of taqwa. He will make matters easy for them. Do we have to learn the hard way? That's number what? That's number four. I share with you a fifth example. But we'll elaborate a little bit more on this one. The people of taqwa, husband and wife, they rush to make peace with Allah Jalla Jalaluhu and mend their personal relationships with Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. Because they recognize that what they do behind closed doors between them and Allah will translate positively or negatively with their relationships with people. There's no such thing as a private sin. There's no such thing as a sin that's only going to affect me. Brothers, sisters will say this. I mean, this is my personal weakness. No one knows about it. I've just got to deal with it, overcome it myself. What does that have to do with my relationship with my kids? What does that have to do with my relationship with my spouse? No, it has everything to do with your relationship with your spouse. You have a positive secret between you and Allah. Allah will translate that virtue between, in your relationship between you and your wife. Similarly, if you have a treacherous behavior between you and Allah, that will become manifest in your relationships with people. There's no escaping that reality. No such thing as a private sin that only affects me. Kalam fadi, nonsense. And I remember the words of the 17th century dean of St. Paul's Cathedral. His name is John Don. And he said, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, part of the whole. What does that mean? No man is an island entire of itself. No man is uh, independent of the world around him. No, you are part of the whole. You're part of a bigger jigsaw puzzle. What you do between yourself and Allah Jalla Jalalu will have a knock-on effect with your relationships with others. And that is why the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he said in the hadith which Al-Bukhari narrates in his Adab Al-Mufrad, on the authority of Anas ibn Malik. He said, مَا تَوَادَّثْنَا لِي فِي اللَّهِ فَيُفَرَّقُ بَيْنَهُمَا إِلَّا بِذَنْبٍ يُحْدِثُهُ أَحَدْهُمَا Any two individuals who used to love each other for the sake of Allah, but then find themselves taking their separate paths, is due to a sin that was committed by one of them. 
Allahu Akbar. Any two individuals who used to love each other for the sake of Allah, they were like this, then find themselves drifting apart, taking their se separate paths. It's because of a sin that was committed by one or the other. So how can one say that the, relate, the sin is just my, it's a personal one, it's not affecting anybody else? It does. Relationships cannot stand against the divine consequences of unrepented sins. There are simply too many narrations from the Qur'an and from the Sunnah, a plethora of them that make it patently obvious that sins affect the fabric of the social order. And our scholars of Islam would remind each other of this reality. That what you do in privately will affect your public relationships. Sufyan ibn Uyayna, one of our predecessors, he said, كان العلماء, the scholars of the past, يكتب بعضهم إلى بعض بهذه الكلمات They used to write to one another letters with these following words. What would they say? Three sentences. مَنْ أَصْلَحَ سَرِيرَتَهُ أَصْلَحَ اللَّهُ عَلَى Whoever corrects his private affairs, Allah will correct for him his public affairs. وَمَنْ أَصْلَحَ مَا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ أَصْلَحَ اللَّهُ مَا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ النَّاسِ And whoever amends his relationship with Allah, Allah will mend his relationship with people. وَمَنْ عَمِلَ لِآخِرَتِهِ كَفَاهُ اللَّهُ أَمْرَ دُنْيَا and whoever works for the hereafter, Allah will suffice you from your worldly problems. La ilaha illallah. Have you not considered, my brother, have you not considered, my sister, that the bitter relationship you may be experiencing with your wife, with your husband, could be due to an unrepented sin that you've allowed in your life? Ah. Oh. So you need not go to the counselor and the shaykh at first hurdle, no. Consider your relationship with Allah first. And perhaps Allah is punishing me with my spouse because of something that I've introduced between me and him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why Al-Hasan al-Basri, he said what? Inni la'arifu dhambi fi khuluqi zawjati wa dabbati. He said, I recognize my own sin in the behavior of my wife and in the behavior of my right. I recognize that I've done something wrong. That requires an apology to my Lord when I see my spouse's behavior changing towards me or when my ride becomes disobedient and difficult. That's how they dealt with their marital problems and their relationships. SubhanAllah. They said, Astaghfirullah, I've upset my Lord somewhere along the lines. And Muhammad ibn Sirin, one of our predecessors, a companion of Anas ibn Malik, the famous interpreter of dreams. Muhammad ibn Sirin, towards the end of his life, he was imprisoned because of a debt that he was unable to repay. And he was tested immensely because of that, subhanAllah. And he says what? Inni la a'rifu dhamba alladhi humila alayya min ajlihi dayn. I know of the sin that I committed that put all of this debt on my back. What was the sin? Qultu li rajulin mundu arba'ina sana, ya muflis. I once insulted a man 40 years ago and I said to him, you're broke. I said to him mockingly, you're broke. 40 years later, here I am. Do you see? They recognize that their worldly problems was a translation of sins that may have happened in their life. That is a sign of virtue. As Abu Sulaiman al-Darani, he said, commenting on this narration I just shared with you, he said, قَلَّتْ ذُنُوبُهُمْ فَعَرِفُوا مِنْ أَيْنَ يُؤْتَوْنْ وَكَثُرَتْ ذُنُوبِي وَذُنُوبُكْ فَلَا نَدْرِي مِنْ أَيْنَ نُؤْتَى He says, their sins were so few, so they knew how Allah was punishing them. They knew which sin it was. And he said, us, our sins have become so many, we don't know how and where and from what is Allah Almighty punishing us for. SubhanAllah. So what do the people of taqwa they do? The people of taqwa turn to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu in an apology whenever they see a discord happening between himself and herself and their spouse. And they say, be them be, this is because of my sin. So a brother, he goes through a difficult time with his spouse and likewise our sister with her husband. And the first thing they do is they retreat. 
and they begin to engage in reflection and introspection. And they begin to analyze their months and their years and their days. And their... Where is the sin? Till you trace it, you isolate it. And you say, Astaghfirullah, Allah forgive me. And the sister, she does the exact same, same thing. And lo and behold, mercy cascades upon them again. Rahmah of Allah opens up. Ease and happiness returns to them. And the difficulty is lifted. I am not suggesting that this is the be all and end all. I'm not saying that every problem in your relationship can be solved in this way. Sometimes there are a variety of issues that causes marital decay. I agree. But this is one of the boxes that must be checked before you eliminate and you think about any other option. And I've mentioned to you this story before. I remember one of our brothers who fell out with his wife. He said, I stormed out of the house and I made my way to the masjid. And he said, Subhanallah, the moment I came inside of the masjid, I found myself very uneasy. I was unsettled. I couldn't relax. I tried to recite Quran. It wasn't happening. I was engaging in dhikr. I wasn't enjoying it. Something was pushing me to go back home. He said, I picked up my bag and I went back home and I knocked on the door. My wife, she opened, she was smiling. She said, you're back. I said, yeah. She said, I knew you'd be back. He said, how come? She said, because the moment you left the house, I was apologizing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was making istighfar, saying, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, Allah forgive me. I knew he'd send you back. So my proposition for this principle I'm sharing with you, dear brother, dear sister, is that before you go knocking on the door of the sheikh or the counselor or any website, you first assess your relationship with Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. Before speaking to anyone about your problem at first hurdle of a strain that is affecting your relationship, consider first that there may be something that has polluted your relationship with Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. And that the solution is a lot nearer to you than you think. And it is through tawbah, through istighfar, through making peace with Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. Allah says, وَأَنِ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ Ask your Lord to forgive you. ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ Then turn to him in repentance. What will be the outcome? يُمَتِّعْكُمْ مَتَاعًا حَسَنًا إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى He will give you a good and true enjoyment until a specified term. Yani until you die. This is the promise of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. And realize that the sins that you and I are accumulating, that is a debt that needs to be paid one way or another. You're putting it on the plastic. And it will come back to haunt you one way or another, and more often than not through relationships. What is the best way to deal with that? By asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive. That is principle number what? Number? La, this is principle number 13. Yeah, the entire principle I mean to say. Correct, and this is principle number 5 as well, the sub from the subheadings. So this was, this was principle number 13. So we're not going to have time to go through the other principles, so perhaps I will just introduce it for you. Principle 14 is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in chapter 3 of the Quran, وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظِ And those who suppress their anger, those who control their rage. And this is a part of an ayah that is describing the people of taqwa from Surah 2 Ali Imran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, let me give you the context of the principle. He said, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ Race to the forgiveness of your Lord. وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ And a paradise, that is the width of the heavens and the earth. أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ That is prepared for the people of taqwa. Who are the people of taqwa? See, subhanAllah, how this principle links in with the principle before it. When we were speaking about taqwa and some of the examples of it. This ayah from Surah to Ali Imran is going to give you another, another set of descriptions of who the people of Taqwa are. Jannah is prepared for the people of Taqwa. Who are they? الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالدَّرَّاءِ They are those who spend from their money during times of adversity and prosperity. وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظِ Those who control their anger. وَالْعَفِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ And they pardon the people. وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And Allah loves the doers of good. Then the verse continues giving other descriptions of the people of taqwa. Which part of this ayah do we want to focus on, brothers? Hmm? 
والكاظمين الغيظ those who control their anger any counselor who deals with marital discord will tell you that anger is a huge predictor of marital decay there was research that happened by uh, there was a bit of research that was conducted by Markman and colleagues and a separate research that was done by John Gottman and his colleagues and they came to the exact same conclusion that one of the major predictors of divorce was not financial adversity was not lack of sexual attraction was not deficient love one of the major predictors of divorce was how that family behave during times of anger and I cannot personally count for you the number of families that have come to me, have come to my colleagues before me, who have complained of a difficult situation that they've landed in, all because of anger. And now they come to the mufti or the sheikh or the brother or the student of knowledge to try to undo the mess that they've put themselves in, all because of anger. And now the brother is weeping with his wife, saying, please, ya sheikh, help me. Find me a way to get back with my wife. Ya Habibi, how many times have you divorced her? Maybe 30 plus times. And now it's the job of the Mufti to pick up this mess and to try to find holes in his divorce. Yes, here you were frothing from the mouth and yes, here you were angry and yes, here you were unconscious and yet to try to put you together. And sometimes it works. You say, Alhamdulillah. There is a chance, but this is your final one. Go back together. And they weep and they hug and they cry. Why did you need to do that then? Put yourself in this situation. And other times you will say, that's it, it's finished. We cannot bring you back together. The Allah Almighty has spoken. We cannot find a way out for your difficult situation. And that's the end of their relationship forever. Why? Because of anger. And similarly, how many times has a, regretted, a regretful wife comes to us? And she's saying, help me. I was angry. What did you do, sister? I was upset. What did you do, sister? I involved certain agencies in our relationship. I made certain phone calls to certain people. And I exaggerated the claims because I was angry. And now they're not leaving us alone. I want them out of my hair. I want them out of my relationship. But it was due to anger, she says. Allah says, well, كَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظِ Those who suppress their anger. There are two caveats I want to share with you here before we proceed. When speaking about anger. The first disclaimer is that not all anger is bad. I don't want to speak about anger, الغيظ, as if it is public enemy, number one. No. Anger is a natural human tendency that Allah Jalla Jalaluhu has placed inside of us for wisdom. And when that anger is managed, and when the expression of that anger is wise, you can see it as a valuable ally. Anger is a way where your body is telling you that there is a problem that requires your attention, and therefore you need to take action. What is it that pushes a parent to snatch up their children from an oncoming bus, it's anger. What is it that causes a husband to go downstairs and to tackle an intruder or a thief in the middle of the night? That's anger. What is it that causes man to stand up to injustice and tyranny and speak the truth in front of dhulm, wrongdoing? It's anger. So, when anger is in its place and in, expressed in the correct way and within its correct context, it is to be seen as a valuable ally. Otherwise, the people of wrongdoing and injustice will roam Allah's earth with impunity and nobody will put them in their place. That's caveat number one. Not all anger is bad. Caveat number two, our Prophet wasallam did become angry. And there's no escaping that reality. In fact, he himself said about himself, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرْ أَغْضَبُ كَمَا يَغْضَبُ الْبَشَرْ I am a human being, and I become angry like human beings do. He said that. And our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, when describing the appearance of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and she spoke about his eyebrows, she says, وَبَيْنَهُمَا عِرْقٌ يُدِرُّهُ الْغَضَبُ And between his 
eyebrows was a vein that would throb when he was angry. Ah, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did become angry, but what made his angry, but what made his anger different to ours? I share with you two differences, and it makes all the difference. Number one, his anger was never for himself. Never for himself. It was never the produce of ego. It was never a haughty anger. It was never an anger that came from personal interests. No. It was only an anger that was expressed when the limits of Allah were violated. Look at all of the incidents in his life when he became angry. It was for his Lord, Jalla Jalalu. مَنْ تَقَمَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لِنَفْسِهِ قَطْ عَائِشَةً said رضي الله عنها Never did he avenge himself إِلَّا أَن تُنْتَهَكَ حُرْمَةٌ مِنْ مَحَارِمِ اللَّهِ فَيَنْتَقِمْ لِلَّهِ Only when the limits of Allah were violated, she said, he would take revenge for the sake of Allah. Look at all of the incidents where he became angry. It was for his Lord. When he saw Ali رضي الله تعالى عنه wearing a garment that was described in, uh, in Sahih al-Bukhari as siyara. Siyara, it means it's uh, a type of clothing that has lines within it, but it's mixed with silk, and silk is only permissible for women. The Prophet sallallahu became angry. Who? For the sake of Allah. He became angry with Ali. And he became angry when he saw Usama ibn Zayd, whom he loved so much, coming to him. And he was speaking to the Prophet والسلام, trying to find a way out for the Makhzumi woman who had stolen. And he was trying to intercede to suggest, please don't cut off her hand. Don't carry out the capital punishment on her. This is an upper class woman. And he became angry with Usama. He said, you're interceding when Allah Almighty has spoken? He became angry for the limits of Allah. When Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu led Salatul Isha and it was so long that people were struggling, some even left the salah. He became very angry with Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu But for who? For the sake of Allah Jalla Jalalu. That's the first difference that made his anger different. It was never for himself. When his personal rights were violated, he was calm and collected, patient and gentle and merciful. But when the limits of Allah were trampled, he was a different man. That is a man. The second thing that made his anger different was that he never went on a tantrum His anger never caused him, for example, to break something, to throw something, to, to smash something, to flip over a table, to spit at someone. He never did that. Even when he became angry, it was a composed anger. And therefore it worked for him, it never worked against him. Scan his entire life and you will fight, you will find rage and tantrums conspicuously absent from his life, alayhi salatu wasalam. Subhanallah, wa innaka la'ala khuluqin azim. Sublime morality, alayhi salatu wasalam. This was an introduction to the topic of anger. Next week, we idhni lahi ta'ala will continue, and I'm going to share with you a three-phase strategy for those who are struggling with their rage, struggling with their anger, and it's affecting their relationships. How do we tame this beast? I will give you some practical suggestions then, inshaAllah, wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.